I welcome everybody. No, welcome everybody to the um, webinar today: safety tips for working in your woods. Um, so, learning about how you can uh, stay safe while having some fun out there. Agnes, can you go to the next slide, please? Yep. If it will advance. <laughs> so this, um, just want to let you know, this is the third webinar in a four-part um, series. The next one will be next uh, next Tuesday as well. The first one was woodland management by objectives, taking stock and making plans, followed by the digital toolbox for the woodland owner. There's an app for that. Um, and then next week on February 23rd, uh, we'll have a wrap up webinar called Getting Started Managing Your Land. Uh, this is all part of a, um, a series called Woodland Stewards put together by a regional team um, of extension professionals from University of Kentucky, Virginia Cooperative Extension, North Carolina State Extension, University of Georgia, Warnell Outreach, University of Tennessee Extension, University of Maryland Extension, and Clemson Extension as well. So I just want to thank all those professionals who've worked together to put this great series together. There are two previous series that um, can be accessed from uh, the website, which I'll put in the chat box. Um, they're series from 2020 and 2019 as well. So um, thanks for so much for joining us. Um, I will ask that um, when you uh, finish off that you do take some time to fill out the evaluation. Um, this program will connect you to an evaluation to fill out that um, provides us some information that we can report back to our bosses and also helps us develop uh, the programs that you need and want and the information that you hope to get in the future. So thanks so much and I'll turn it back over to Agnes. Great, thanks Leslie. Great, um, so just some quick introductions. My name's Agnes from the University of Maryland um, Extension. I'm the Woodland Stewardship Educator. I do landowner outreach and education and I coordinate the Maryland Delaware Master Logger Program. So if you're in um, the Mid-Atlantic region or curious about some Maryland programs, feel free to contact me. There's my email address right there. And I partnered with Jennifer Gagnon uh, from Virginia Cooperative Extension. She coordinates the Virginia Forest Landowner Education Program at Virginia Tech, and she's been doing that since 2005. She develops education programs and materials for thousands of forest landowners throughout Virginia every year. So she's a great resource for those of you in Virginia. The, uh, so some of those programs include short courses, field tours, and quarterly newsletters and a website. The Virginia Forest Landowner Update and numerous publications on a variety of forest management topics. So we wanted to introduce ourselves, um, letting you know that we're here as forestry extension professionals. If you have any questions about your forest, um, the topic that we're gonna be talking about today is um, taking simple precautionary steps that can make your time in the woods more enjoyable and productive while working outside has many benefits for your personal health, including clean air and exercise. There are a few things to do to keep yourself uh, safe from those itchy, bitey, pokey things out there. Learn more about ways to stay safe while working in the woods, even with power tools. I'm excited about this presentation. Um, and some of the housekeeping items we have is, uh, you know, you're connecting with extension professionals. If you have uh, questions about your forest or the programs you want to learn more about, you were just introduced today to Leslie, Robert, Agnes. So we got North Carolina, Maryland, uh, Virginia in there. Um, this webinar is being recorded. Thank you all for uh, keeping your video off and muted. We appreciate that. Leslie said that the video is going to be available at the Forestry Webinar Portal. As she mentioned, she's going to put that link in the chat. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free. Ask away. Ask away. Um, Leslie's really great at um, going through the questions at the end. So you can see your Q&A section there um, for, for putting those questions in. So our two speakers today are Emily Zobel from University of Maryland Extension and Jason Fisher from Virginia Cooperative Extension. I'll do a brief introduction uh, about Emily in a second here. What I did wanna introduce you to is Jennifer and I created this woodland safety checklist and chainsaw safety checklist. We thought this might be a little helpful for you to kind of get some ideas and making sure that you're going out and you're uh, making sure that you're feeling confident and going out there, you know, something to share with your kids, with uh, your neighbors, anything like that. I'm going to pop that link in the chat once um, we get going here. 
I did want to introduce you to Emily Zobel. She's going to be our first speaker today. Um, she is the Agricultural uh, Faculty Extension Assistant for Dorchester County here in Maryland, so uh, kind of the lower mid-shore. Um, she received her Bachelor of Science in Ecology and a Master's of Science in Entomology. Uh, from University of Maryland College Park. Her thesis work focused on feeding and reproductive habits of the bar brown marmorate stink bug on veg vegetable crops. Prior to grad school, she worked as a lab and field technician for the entomology department of University of Maryland, coordinating or conducting research and pesticide usage and sustainable agricultural practices. I'm excited to stop sharing my screen and um, asking Emily to share her screen. Emily, uh, thanks for joining our crew here and we're excited to hear your presentation. Thank you guys so much for having me. Give me one sec and I will get my screen shared. Um, so hopefully you're seeing the PowerPoint now. Awesome, I'm getting a thumbs up from Agnes. I'm gonna go ahead and actually keep my um, video off because I feel really self-conscious watching myself speak as I'm giving this. So, uh, but anyways, thank you guys so much for having me on. I am gonna be talking about some of the bugs that kind of bite us and are not good for our health that you'll find in the woods. So this is a, a slightly different talk than you guys are probably used to where normally someone would be talking about, you know, emerald ash borer or something like that. but. Nonetheless, my email address is on there. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact me um, afterwards. I'm happy to answer any questions or get you guys in contact with someone in your area who can help. So we're gonna start off first talking about chiggers. So these are also known uh, by a wide variety of names that you can see there. Most people call them red bugs or scab itchy mites um, or scabies. So they are actually an arachnid, so this is not a true insect. Um, they engage in this more complex life cycle that you can see on the screen here. Get my laser. So you have an egg followed by a larvae, and then a sort of a bunch of nymphs followed by an adult. Um, the number of lathes they have changes and so forth. But specifically with regards to chiggers, we're talking about the larvae stage, which is this one right here, of the trauma bacilli mites. Um, all these other life stages feed on plants or decaying matters. It's only this larvae stage that feeds on a host, which would be you or me or your dog or your cat or a deer in the woods or something like that. These guys do tend to get one to two generation per year here in the mid-Atlantic um, and throughout most of the states that are a little bit north and a little bit south of us. And you do tend to find peaks in their numbers spring and in fall. So their numbers will peak in the spring, go down a little bit in the summer and then peak again in the fall. But you can come across these throughout the summer. And I know that there have been people that have gotten them in kind of late fall, what a lot of people would consider early winter if we have a really mild winter as well. So it's a common preconceived notion that these guys feed on blood. They're actually not feeding on blood at all. They're not getting deep enough into your system to feed on your blood. So what they're actually doing is feeding on your skin cells. So when a trigger gets on you, it's going to find a pore or a hair follicle, and then it's going to take its teeth and it's gonna bite down into that and it's gonna spit up a little bit of spit. And what that spit is going to do is harden and break down the skin cells around it. And it basically creates this kind of little hard straw. So think of this as like a bamboo or metal straw into your skin. And then through using this, it can spit in and then suck up and spit in and suck up and spit in and suck up. And as it's doing this, it breaks down your skin cells around it and then slurps them back up and then repeats. It'll feed for about three days if they're not removed. Um, but what happens is, is even after they're removed, you have this sort of hardened feeding tube that they've created in you. And that's what's creating kind of this red bump and your immune system's reacting to it because it's not normal for your body to have this. So that's what's going to cause that intense itching sensation. And that can start within a few hours of them feeding and can last a few weeks. And if you're really sensitive, it can even last a whole month. So what to do if you do encounter some chiggers? So the first thing that you wanna do is get, is remove them as fast as you can. So 
warm soapy water tends to work with a washcloth really well because they are very small and they'll get um, dislodged. And then when you do have the bites, which you can see is all over this gentleman's leg, um, you do want to avoid scratching them. By scratching them and potentially opening them up, you allow for secondary infections from other things. You can definitely get um, some anti-itch cream and take an antihistamine to sort of deal with it. If you are very sensitive to this, you may want to go see your primary care provider or a physician. They can sometimes give you steroid shots or other things that can help deal with kind of the itchy scratchiness of this. So some simple things that you can do when out in the woods to prevent getting them in the first place is keeping a clothing barrier between you and them. And I think you guys are probably much better at this than the general public when they go, you know, hiking or what have you. But things like long sleeve shirts, pants, boots, any sort of tight woven fabrics. So knits are particularly good, but at least on your bottom half, you want kind of those tighter woven fabrics because you're more likely going to get triggers from kind of um, the waist down. Most people don't get them up on their top because these arachnids really like tall grassy areas. So you're not going to necessarily find this in the woods as much as like that meadow area between the woods um, and kind of grass to so that border area and then in actual meadows as well. So if on your property, you've got to hike through kind of a grassy area to get from one side to another, or if you're taking a break in one or, you know, what forth, that's where you're more likely going to find sugars. So things like DEET and permethrum work really well. And you can also dust your shoes with sulfur. Um, the powder kind of, it, they don't particularly like the scent and the smell of it, and they have a hard time gripping because of the, the powderness of sulfur. So all of those are really great. And you can see that's what the gentleman's doing right here. He just has a kind of old sock tied and filled with sulfur and he just pats down his shoes with it. You can also do the pushing, um, pulling your socks over your pants. It's, I know it's not a great fashion statement, but um, this way, if you happen to get sugars on your shoes or on your socks, it's a little bit harder and for them to get to you unless you've got really loose woven fabrics, in which case sometimes they can get through. And then again, once you've kind of been in an area where you may have them, or if you do have them scrubbing with a soapy washcloth will help dislodge them. And if you were wearing clothes that potentially got them on, you're gonna to wanna to wash those clothes in very hot water, at least 120 degrees Fahrenheit heat wise and or after you've washed them, get put them in the dryer on high heat because the heat will dehydrate these nights and kill them. So I'm gonna go ahead and move into ticks now. So ticks are also an arachnid, so they're not an insect, but unlike the mites that we just talked about, these guys are obligated blood feeders. So every life stage, they are going to feed on blood and blood is the only thing that they wanna feed on. In the United States, we have about 80 species of ticks. Um, some of them are going to be what we call hard ticks, which is what I'm gonna focus on most of today's talks, but we do have soft ticks as well that just don't have the plate on their back. And I think it's important to remember that these guys are really small. Your adult is about the size of a poppy seed. So you're likely not going to feel these crawling on you. You're not likely gonna feel these biting you. You may not even notice them even when they're engouged. So ticks do have a multi-life, multi-year lifespan. Um, so just like with the chiggers, they do have sort of a more complicated lifespan. So they will have eggs that are normally laid in the spring that will hatch out into larvae that will metamorph into nymphs and then into adults that will then in return lay eggs. So this is the common one for the deer leg or the deer tick or black legged tick. Um, some ticks will take two years to complete the life cycle. Some will take three. Um, some can do it in one year if they can find host. It's really variable from species to species as well as how quickly they can kind of uh, molt from stage to stage as well as how quickly they can find a host. And you can definitely, there have been studies that have found that certain ticks can last entire years in between host species. So kind of take this all a little bit with a, a grain of salt and that these can vary. But what I kind of want you to focus on is that throughout every single one of these seasons, there's some level of tick activity. Um, they do overwinter at all stages. They are active in the winter, which we'll talk about in a sec as well. 
So the black legged tick, which is the one that transmits Lyme disease, which will be the main focus that I'll talk about when we get to diseases, is active anytime it's above freezing. So when it's below freezing, um, they can't move their muscles. So they kind of go into a mild hibernational state. But if it's above freezing, they're active and they can be hunting for food sources. So just because you're out in the woods in the wintertime, don't think that you don't need to worry about ticks. Now, the good news is in the wintertime, when it's 32 degrees outside, chances are you're wearing a lot more clothing. So the likelihood of them getting onto you because of the clothing barrier increases, but they will still be out there hunting for food. So ticks hunt for food by doing what we call questing. So they don't fly, they don't jump, they don't do anything like that. They hold out their front legs as they hold onto a piece of grass or a bush leaf. And when you walk by or a deer walks by or a host walks by, they grasp on with those front legs and they kind of crawl really quickly on. Once they are on you, they are going to try to find a place to feed. And they like to feed for a long period of time. These guys are not like small little eaters. These guys are like buffet Thanksgiving day kind of feeders. Like they wore their sweatpants, they are here to eat. So what they're gonna basically do is they have this sheath mouth part that has these serrated edges. So they're going to slide this in and then pull back the sheath part and this serrated edge here will help hold them in place so that they can feed long-term. So this is why when you have a tick on you, it's so hard to remove them is because they've got these serrated edges on their mouth to hold them in. And here's just a quick graphic that you can see about how large they'll get over the course of a week one feeding. So again, they're poppy seed to watermelon seed when they're unfed and they can get, you know, close to dime size or so when they are, at least this is the case of the dog or of the deer tick, sorry. Um, and again, some tick species are a little smaller, so this might vary a little bit. So our big concern with regards to ticks and feeding isn't so much the tick feeding itself. While there are some people that will have an allergic reaction to the saliva from the tick, the bigger concern here is the diseases that they carry. Um, the, the more upbeat news is that the majority of them don't carry this straight out of birth, meaning that they contract it from their first host. So throughout that entire life cycle, they're gonna feed on at least three host animals um, and they normally in that initial life stage will contract it from say a, a white-footed mouse or a bird or something like that. And then when the next life stage or the adult stage feeds on you, that's when they're going to transmit it. Unlike something like a mosquito where they're in for that quick feed and can transmit it really quickly, ticks take a lot longer. It's gonna take about 24 to 48 hours of that tick feeding on you for the pathogen to get transmitted. And that's just because of the way that the pathogens are held in the tick's gut. So as the tick feeds and your blood is moved into their gut, the proteins are broken down and moved throughout the tick's body, but the water that's in your blood is normally moved into the tick's saliva gland and the pathogens will go with it to the saliva gland. So then when the tick continues to spit into you to keep your blood from clotting, that's when the pathogen gets moved into your actual body. So if you find a tick just crawling on you and it doesn't look like it's fed, you're okay. Um, so how can we go about preventing some tick bites? So wearing long sleeves and long pants again, that's just creating a, a fabric barrier between you and the tick. You can again do the fabulous tucking your shirt into your pants and your pants into your socks. Because again, if a tick were to get onto your shoe, it's gonna have to curl all the way up your pants before it's gonna get to any open skin. You can treat your clothes with permethrin. This is a really easy way to do it. Um, please note though that this is chemical is rather toxic to cats. So you do wanna apply it outside away from any feline friends and then any clothes that you have that are treated with it. Um, once it's dry, it's not as toxic, but I still wouldn't recommend like letting your cat lay on any of them. Um, and then whenever you've been in a tick habitat, you always wanna check for them just to be on the safe side. Um, and that's sort of, you know, if you're gonna come home anyways and take a, a warm shower, just using a washcloth and kind of scrubbing all of your areas and then checking your hair really well and so forth for them. They do tend to like to be in places where there's seam lines as well. And a lot of your tick species are going to be in areas where there's kind of the underbrush or that transition zone. 
and or leaf litter. So if you were down like in the leaf litter or something like that, squatting or taking measurements or you know anything like that, that's a likely where you're gonna get them as well. So sometimes we don't always want to be fully covered, especially in Maryland or in the Southern areas in the middle of summer. So if you are gonna have open skin, uh, make sure you put on sunscreen first, but then you can use DEET really easily. You never wanna apply DEET underneath clothing though, because it works by creating kind of a vapor pocket around you. So if it's under your clothes, the chemical can't dissipate. Um, you never wanna use DEET on pets. It's highly toxic to dogs and cats. Another great trick is to keep a lint roll or a roll of duct tape with you because you can make a loop like this and just roll it up and down you. And, and here's all of those tiny little larvae that are too small to see, but are easily picked up. Um, as soon as you leave one of these habitats, you wanna shower when possible and throw your clothes again. Heat's gonna really do a good job killing these guys. So if you're going to launder them first, that's great. Make sure you dry them on high heat. And if you're not necessarily going to launder them, because I know sometimes I wear the same pair of work pants week or day after day after day, toss them in the dryer on high heat for five to 10 minutes and that'll dehydrate and kill any ticks that are on them. So if you were to find a tick on you, you do want to remove it as soon as possible. Um, the CDC does not recommend using Vaseline, liquid soap, or alcohol in a cotton ball. What you really want to do is just use a fine pair, a fine tip pair of tweezers and grasp it as close to your skin as possible. For hard ticks, they have that hard shell. You want to make sure that you get that hard shell and that you're not just squeezing like the tip of their abdomen. Because if you're just squeezing up here, you're likely going to cause them to regurgitate into you. So any pathogens they did have would automatically get into you. So grasp them as close to the skin as you can and just pull straight up. You don't wanna pull at an angle, you wanna pull straight up. And it's going to kind of take a few tugs or so because again, they've got that serrated mouth, but you can eventually get them out. If you do have to disconnect it from its head, that's okay. You can go um, see a primary care provider to see about getting you know, the head removed or what has, but the main point is to get the body removed because that's where pathogens would be. You can then take this and either put it in a pill bottle with rubbing alcohol or stick it on a piece of clear tape and stick it in the freezer and then put a date on it. I would also recommend marking any place you found them feeding with a Sharpie um, on your body and just keep an eye on it because if you do have any kind of rash or anything develop around that area, you wanna remember where it was. So when it comes to identifying ticks, um, the hard ticks have a plate on their back called a scutum. Um, and this is a really nice tool that you can use to identify what species of tick you have come across. So here are some of the common ones. Um, this is also a resource that I have sent to Agnes and the rest of the team that can share with you and it's available on the University of Maryland Extension's website, or you can email me and I'd be happy to send it to you. So this is a chart of the common types of ticks that you will find on the Eastern seaboard. So, most of these are found in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, the Gulf Coast tick is found in Southern Maryland on down throughout North Carolina, South Carolina and that. Um, so this works for you guys as well. If you are from Canada or California or Oregon, you guys are gonna have some slightly different species, but you can check out some resources like the CDC has a really great resource for ticks as well as some of the other resources I'll have at the end. We'll have species that are more found in your areas. So when it comes to common diseases, here's a list of several of the common diseases that you can find in the United States. I'm gonna just quickly touch on Lyme disease, but just note that that's not the only one that can get transmitted. So Lyme disease is the most widespread vector-borne disease in the United States. You can see in 2018, all the dots where it was commonly found. So it, we did have cases found across the country, but again, the majority were found in kind of the Northeastern area and then across the Great Lakes. Um, I know there have been some studies that have shown that there are more and more cases kind of getting spread out as the deer tick population kind of spreads throughout the rest of the United States. So just because um, you're not in one of these areas doesn't necessarily mean that you can't contract it. It is a multi-somatic disease, which means that different people are gonna have different symptoms. And there's a wide variety of symptoms from fatigue um, to fevers, to rashes, to all kinds of things. Uh, only about 30 to 50 
or 30 to 50% of people don't actually get that typical bullseye rash. And if you are a person of color, due to the darkness of your skin, if the rash were to develop, you may not see it. And if you, the tick was feeding and say like your hair or something, you also may not see the rash. So don't think that you can't have Lyme disease because you never had that bullseye rash. This is exclusively vectored by the black legged tick and the Western black legged tick. There are a lot of other of the tick diseases that I shared earlier that have very similar symptoms. So a lot of times doctors will call things Lyme disease, even if it's not this particular bacteria. And it's important to note that when the tick feeds and the bacteria is in your system, it's circulating in the blood then, but within a few days, it settles out of the blood and starts moving into your tissue. So this is one of the reasons why it's really hard for doctors to diagnose Lyme disease is because they can't hunt for the bacterium itself. They have to look for your body's reaction to the bacteria or your body's antibodies in reaction to it. Um, I'm going to skip that because we're getting a little short on time. So I'm going to finish up just talking about yellow jackets and wasps. Um, so this is something that you may come across in your wooded area. So this would be a yellow jacket um, nest. And as long as this isn't close to your home or a place where people are actively going to be, you're probably okay. If it's on a tree that you're getting ready to harvest or to thin out, you may want to wait until winter time. Um, so these nests will die out in winter with the first hard frost. So then you could come through and knock it down and go ahead and take that tree. Um, but if you had one that was active, I would not recommend cutting down that tree and having that nest break open because these guys, because they're social, are very protective and can be very aggressive of their homes. So ideally, you would want to wait to harvest or trim or cut any trees that had this until winter time, because by then again, it's going to be dead. Um, so if you did happen to get stung by a yellow jacket or a wasp, you want to remove the stinger as soon as you can, wash the area, um, and then you can put an ice pack on it and take an antihistamine. And then if you do have difficulty breathing or have someone who has an allergic reaction, you wanna seek medical help immediately. So with that, here is a wide variety of resources. Um, you can check the University of Maryland Extension or whatever state you're in, their extension website should have some good information about ticks. The University of Rhode Island, specifically has their Tick Encounter Resource Center, which is tickencounter.org. And they have a wide variety of information about IDing ticks and all kinds of stuff. Texas A&M and University of Kentucky both also have some great resources for those of you who live in those areas. And then the Center for Disease Control and NIH have some great resources with regards to the disease management. And there is my email address as well if you guys have any questions. Hey folks, Jennifer Gagnon here. Um, thanks for everybody uh, tuning in today. And thanks, Emily, for that creepy crawly presentation. I think we're all probably busy checking our pant legs right now. Um, so I do see that there are quite a few questions in the Q&A box. And I just want to let everybody know who's asked those. We will get to the questions at the end of the webinar today. But I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next presenter, uh, Jason Fisher is a Virginia Cooperative Extension's Central District Forestry and Natural Resources Agent. Um, and I've been working with him in that role since 2006. He lives in Halifax, Virginia with his wife and his two daughters. And uh, Jason is a Virginia Tech graduate. He has a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, both in natural resources related fields. And Jason is an amateur taxidermist. He also hunts and fishes and he loves sharing uh, the, the wonders of those activities with other interested people. Uh, Jason's also a veteran and he served in the desert storm conflict of the early 1990s um, as standby status with the Virginia Army National Guard. So Jason's getting his video up right now and uh, he's going to talk to you about chainsaw safety. Hey, thanks, Jennifer. So we're going to hit play. Got a video for you. Hope you enjoy it. And then we'll discuss a couple of things at the end. Jason, we're only seeing part of your video screen at the moment. There you go. Good afternoon and welcome. I'd like to introduce myself briefly. I'm Jason Fisher, Extension Forester for Southside. 
I want to thank you for participating in the Woodland Stewards course. Uh, Jennifer Gagnon as a colleague of mine and asked if I put together a section for the safety portion of this. And so I'm going to do a, a short session for you on one topic that we get a lot of questions on. Uh, but first, a little bit of background. Uh, my, most of the work I do uh, in teaching chainsaw safety, I do with a colleague with another agency with the Sharp Logger program. And so a lot of what we teach uh, has to do with OSHA standards and safety measures, as well as just common sense approach tactics uh, to what to do in the woods when you're running a chainsaw. So first we need to just emphasize that if you can get someone to do the work for you, even if you have to pay them, please do. But oftentimes we get people uh, that have a storm event and a tree's blown over in the yard, uh, which we get a lot of that. Uh, or they just want to go out and cut firewood, and so they take measures upon themselves to go do that without first thinking about their own personal safety and the safety of others for that matter. Uh, types of chainsaws. I won't spend a lot of time in, in that uh, other than to tell you that first you need to pick a, a model that you can handle, okay? Uh, physically handle. Uh, steel, uh, farm boss, this is a 290. And, and as I get older, I'm looking hard at the, the next model below, okay? But my point here is choose something that you can physically handle. Um, the, I get asked some about the battery-operated chainsaws. I've run those. Uh, they work great. Uh, uh, an advantage I see of them is you don't have to deal with the, the mess of oil and gas, obviously. Uh, the batteries are very expensive. Uh, however, uh, if you're gonna choose to get an electric chainsaw, my advice to you is to use it for limbing uh, and cutting small trees. Out on a very windy day, and by the way, this is not a day that you would wanna cut a tree. You would want the tree already down so you could cut the tree up. So first lesson is don't cut trees on a windy day. All right, so personal protective equipment, a couple of things with you today. Uh, we're gonna start with the head and work down to our feet. And I have prescription glasses on and they help me see, but unless I've got a prescription pair that has side protection on it, I'd want to use uh, safety glasses like this to protect your eyes. That's a, that's a must. So we're starting with our eyes. And this headgear here, which you rarely see anybody cut with, I get it, but what we're gonna teach is the proper thing that you need to be doing. Because it's important that you return safely to do it again another day, right? So hard hat. All right, and you can see if I press in on the sides kind of hard with that. This one's holding up well because I keep it inside out of the elements and away from the sun. Um, if you happen to have a hat that's been setting and sun has been exposed to it, it can uh, begin to, to dry rot and it can crack. So to test your hard hat, if you have one laying around, you want to check that. Uh, so head protection is key because of falling debris. Uh, dead limbs, uh, just uh, the top of a tree may fall out, whatever. And keep in mind, hard hats are designed to deflect object. Okay, so object would fall, hit the hard hat and deflects off to the side. And that's why this webbing inside, you move these earmuffs out of the way so you can see that. The webbing inside is, is meant to absorb and twist. You can adjust it on, with a dial on the back for your head size. These are very affordable. You can pick them up at any hardware store or steel shop, Husqvarna, whatever you choose. The key thing is nothing goes in between the webbing and the top of your hat, okay? Like a sandwich, extra pair of gloves, okay? So keep that space free. So moving down to ear protection, this hat happens to have earmuffs already attached to it, which is great. So that's something you don't have to leave at home and forget. 
just regular earplugs work. Head, ear, and eyes, that, that takes care of that part. We're gonna move down to the legs, okay, to chaps. This one will be a great time to be wearing these. These are pants, chaps. Uh, they're just like wearing a pair of pants, coveralls. Uh, they're not cheap, but that is a Kevlar and ballistic nylon material. Uh, I have these for cold weather cutting. They're practically new. I haven't been worn much, but we're gonna go best to second best. So best is gonna be a pants type of coveralls if you can afford those. Um, in this case, mine are demo only. I don't wear them all the time, but I do wear these. So this is an apron type chap. And so it would go down around your waist here, and then the, the straps would be tightened on the back sides of your legs, okay? So the key thing is that these straps, which these have a, a clip type buckle, these straps need to be tight, almost to the point where they're uncomfortable. You don't want the pants slipping very loosely around on your leg. A section right here on these chaps where I learned a lesson this past winter. Okay, so pay attention. Okay, you see in the sun here, see this rip? And it's not big. You see the material that's coming out of there? Okay, that's that ballistic nylon. I saw that fly right up by my face. And the short of the story is essentially I was being careless. Uh, being careless in that I was tired. Um, a friend and I were cutting. That's the first point I want to make to you is tell somebody where you're going, okay? But I had someone with me. They were a distance away, at least two tree links. We were both uh, cutting and releasing oak trees. So we're doing crop tree release. And so we were moving along pretty, pretty good pace. And we were cutting trees probably not much bigger than our thigh. So it's pretty quick work, but it, it took a lot of time. So basically, uh, I got tired. I went through a whole tank of gas. And for me personally, uh, my limits are, once I run through a tank of gas, I, I stop about 10 minutes and rest. I was on my second tank and hadn't rested, so I was tired and I was careless. And uh, what I failed to do was to put my chain brake on before I stepped and made motion to go cut the next tree. So the, the chain was still running on the bar. When I stepped forward, the chain caught these chaps right here. And so the chaps did their job, essentially, is what, I, what I'm trying to share with you. They did what they were supposed to do. Had the chain been running a little faster, probably would have ripped a bigger hole. And it, it did pull these chaps around on my leg a little bit, is the other point I wanted to make. So the first point back earlier in review was uh, always share with someone where you're going or have somebody with you, more importantly. Uh, and that way, you can have the enjoyment later on of providing warmth for a cabin or a shop or your home. If you choose to use firewood or maybe you're just uh, removing a tree that's posing a hazard to some of your property or your home. That last area would be foot protection. And I have steel toe boots here, made in the good old US of A. And so a steel toe boot is certainly best. Uh, protects from heavy objects, uh, even a tree rolling over on the end of your toe if, you, if you're standing where you shouldn't be. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about a used saw. So let's say you, you find one on, uh, online for sale or your neighbor has one that's used, okay? In this case, make sure the chain brake is working. So if I push upwards, I can now slide the chain on the bar. You hear that? Now I cannot, okay? So that chain brake, when I was telling you earlier about me getting tired and stepping forward, that's what I was talking about. So prior to me stepping forward, the saw was running. You know, I can guess it. I should have just pushed that forward just like that. Real, real easy step. It's actually meant, meant to be done right there with your hands, pushing forward, okay? The other thing is the guide bar here, where my hand is. That is your sight. Let's so say you're sighting down this bar, straight away from you, to choose your notch uh, direction and the direction you want the tree to fall. So it's pretty cool. <clears throat> Throttle interlock, that's a piece here on the handle. See that? 
Okay, that should be there. In other words, I, if I pull the trigger with the gas here, it's a safety. It, it can't, I can't rev it up until I put my hand on and depress that, uh, that safety feature, okay? So make sure that's on there, that's important. So, and then the last piece is down in here, and that's the chain catch peg. Right there where my finger is, okay? So that's a peg there. In case the chain were to break and come off, it would catch on that and it wouldn't come flying out and harm someone. Is when you're cutting, um, make sure there's not anyone standing directly in line of where you're pointing this saw, okay? Um, when I used to teach hunter safety, uh, we used to ask people, hey, what's the first thing you do when you pick up a firearm? And they would always say, always the answer was make sure it's not loaded or check the safety is on both of which are correct but not the right answer the best answer is control the direction of where you're pointing that that way no one can get hurt so your first thing to think of is well my chain's probably not going to come off and it probably won't but in the event that it does you can at least prevent that. So that's a safety measure I want to tell you about is when you're doing your cutting, make sure there's no one standing in the direction of where you're pointing. A lot of folks don't think about that, but it's just, you know, can you be too safe? No. Okay, so saving a little time, I've took off the back of the saw here. You just turn this uh, piece here, this dial, and it pops right off. <clears throat> and I've removed the old air filter, which is dirty and stopped up okay so if your saw can't breathe good it'll get hot on you and it'll shorten the life of the engine so i've gone online and i ordered a kit um, a new air filter kit pretty simple and uh you take the old one off you pop the new one on and you use this wrench that i was showing you earlier to take off the bar and you tighten the screws down on that so replacing the air filter is an important maintenance piece I want to tell you today on your chainsaw. And when you order these kits, you can get a kit for usually less than 15 bucks. You can order them straight from Steel or Husqvarna or even Amazon. You can get those uh, replaced. Uh, the kits will come with usually a spark plug, new spark plug here. I'm going to save it until I absolutely have to have one. Uh, but you should you should check those and make sure they're not worn. Uh, the chainsaw will run a lot better with a good spark plug. And the fuel filter. A little fuel filter here that pops right on the fuel line that goes inside the tank. You can replace that as well. Typically, I replace this air filter, like this dirty one here. I've been cleaning it. I replace it about every 25 to 30 hours. Uh, the maintenance manual may tell you something different. All right. So we'll come right back and we'll take our chainsaw bar off and also show you how to sharpen the chain. Okay, so sharpening. Well, this one isn't in bad shape, but I'll show you. So if you're gonna freehand sharpen a chain, you need to just get a table, something level, something that you can get a good angle on the chain with. Right now, I've got the bar running from me and I'm about a 45 degree angle from the chain. And you don't push down Okay, you simply go upwards. A little short, quick motions, okay? What you're doing is trying to get that edge sharp and unlock the chain brake. I can move the chain. You just go all the way around like that on this side. All right, so I've sharpened my chain. I've turned it the opposite way so you can get the grooves on the other side. You have to go both directions. So we spun it around. So once I get that side sharp, as far as taking your bar off and checking things and cleaning out, and this isn't gonna be pretty because this saw gets used. So this isn't staged, this is just as is. And loosen up the, the nuts just enough to turn with your hand. Take the cover off. All right, so if you can see here where the tip of my uh, file is, if I can get up there close right there, 
That's the oil port that allows the oil to get through on the chain. It's a 45 degree angle. It's kind of ground through. You see, I can almost get this tip through there. A toothpick works perfect. You can clean that port out so that you always have free flowing oil, bar oil, to your chain. That's something that's going to stop up on you a lot. So in between cuts and in between jobs, make sure that that port is open. Okay. And so you have one on each side. Here's one on the, the opposite side here. All right. Okay, so that's part of the video shot. And now we're going to start another video with an actual <clears throat> bore cut technique to get some action going to finish up. And so I mentioned earlier, I worked with a colleague, Brian Wagner, with Forestry Mutual Insurance. And since he's got his blaze orange on, I just borrowed this video from him with the weather like it is here in Virginia. And, and by the way, we're running chainsaws every day here. Uh, we're still without power and there's a lot of trees on the ground, so be safe. So what he's doing here, he's chosen his direction. He used that uh, bar, siding bar, to point the direction he wanted the tree to fall. He's Notice he cut the the down cut first. It's much easier to, to meet that cut uh, when you cut it first. And then you come in from the front and make the rest of your notch. And so <clears throat> once the notch is cut from the tree, here's the bore part. And this is particularly important for loggers. And, and if you're cutting timber, you don't want to rip the center of the tree out. I just did this actually on my own property with a timber sale uh, that my wife and I had. So he's just bored the center out, and now he's doing what I call cutting the ears off. And all that's doing is removing the butt swell on each side, so it helps, you know, if you, your bar isn't far enough to go all the way through, and you can see better when you actually bore from the side. So he's cut the center out of the tree. Now he's going to the downhill side. This is the side he doesn't want the tree to go to. You see that water behind him? So he's going to cut a notch over there. And I did mention earlier with some of your tools of using a wedge. And I rarely see people use these. Uh, these are a lifesaver, particularly if you need to move a tree a little ways. And so you notice he'll put a wedge on the back side of this tree to ensure that the tree doesn't set down on that side. You see him beating it in there. And so that wedge is going to hold that back corner, which he's opened up and he's bored through from that side. He's going to look around. See that no one's walked around while he's been cutting. Uh, by the way, he did cut a path for this tree to fall in so we wouldn't get any spring poles. I failed to mention that. And now he's essentially coming through on the opposite side. This tree is so big, even a 20 inch bar wouldn't go all the way through. And so he's going to cut the rest of the way through and then swing around on the back and release the tree. The other key thing, if you notice when he walks away, he walks away at a 45 degree angle from where he's finished cutting. That's your only safe direction to be going. And I might add, um, that's the end of the video. It had some sound that'd be a loud crash. It was actually supposed to keep you all awake. <laughs> um, but I, I wanna put this up here if you can see me. Uh, first aid kit, okay? This says logger's first aid kit, but I keep one in the truck and I failed to mention that in the tip sheet. So sorry about that, Jennifer, Agnes. I do wanna add that that is a important piece to have with you should you have an accident, but hopefully those tips will help you. That's very basic, I know. Uh, the, the conventional cut, which is cutting from the backside is fine. Uh, you'll see that in the PowerPoint that you get sent. But the issue there is when you cut from the back, the tree is moving while you're cutting and that's what we don't want. So that's why I teach the conventional bore cut, even to, to landowners, because the tree moves when you want it to, okay? So you have control over that. So uh, again, that's short and sweet, but I hope you find that helpful. Great, that was great, Jason. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Emily, for uh, doing your talk too. It looks like we have about a few more minutes. Leslie, I don't know if you want me to start off with going through the questions or if you'd like to help. 
before Leslie gets on there, I want you to see, oh my gosh, you guys, have you been checking out that chat? All those resources there are so great. Jason created um, a safety checklist for y'all and it's in there in the, the, there's a link to it in the chat and some of the links that Emily mentioned in her talk are there. So if you haven't checked out the link, uh, the chat box, uh, have a look. All right, thanks, Leslie. Thanks guys, Emily and Jason, thank you. Great, thanks. I just want to um, say thanks to the speakers and then just reiterate this is part of a series. Uh, we did have some snafus where the server that hosts the webinar portal did um, go down. So if anyone's joining us late or um, it was because the server power went out. Um, but this recording will be available in a few days in a few days and at the same link that you joined it from. And um, you can uh, get you can go to the next webinar on February 23rd and also um, pre-register for that as well. And you can access any of these webinars uh, um, from this series and from previous series at the um, at the HTTPS colon um, backslash SREF.info website as well. Um, so from here, we'll just go ahead and take some questions. We are going to run into the two o'clock hour. So um, I will announce when it's two o'clock so we can, uh, if anyone needs to leave, they can move on from there. Um, I would also like to note if you do leave at any moment, please um, finish out the forestry webinar process and take the evaluation. And Bob, would you mind putting that evaluation in the chat box for people in case they miss it? Um, I will make sure that's done. All right, great. Okay, so we're gonna go over some questions here and I'm gonna start with the Q&A, but um, I'll let my co-hosts, if they see any questions in the chat box, also go into it. So. Yeah, I think I heard this question answered, but I'll go ahead and repeat it again. Um, today in my area, there's still snow on the ground, but the air temperature will reach a high of 49 degrees. Would still ticks still be out with the snow on the ground? Yep. If it's above freezing, ticks will still be out even uh, if there's snow on the ground. Um, I can, I'm not gonna pull the slide back up, but one of the pictures on there was a tick found in Rhode Island where it was fully engouged walking on top of snow. Mm -hmm. um, so as long as it's above freezing, they can be out. Obviously, if there's snow on the ground and they're down in that leaf litter, which is where they like to stay when they're not questing, they're not gonna necessarily climb up through snow. But if there are, if it's like melted enough that they can get up onto a branch or uh, some tall grass or something, they can be questing. Right. And I think um, this might have been touched on as well, but um, how does it take uh, 24 to 48 hours to be infected by a tick since the pathogen is already in the tick and would have been moving throughout its body prior to biting the host? Yeah, so uh, I, I answered that already, but basically most of these pathogens live in the gut of the tick. So they're not like the pathogens that are in mosquitoes that we normally think of. So in a mosquito, the pathogens in the saliva gland already. So when it feeds, it automatically goes in. In the case of the tick, it needs to move from the gut to the saliva gland. And it does this as it's feeding because you have water coming in with all the protein that's in your blood as well. So as that water and protein moves to the saliva gland, the pathogen kind of comes with it. So that's why it takes about 24 hours to 48 for it to do to get the pathogen into the saliva gland and then get into you. Cool. Um, and someone had a question, are, are chiggers on the East Coast only? Because someone has not heard of them out in Oregon. So they can be found across uh, the United States and across the globe. They're not so much like an East Coast, West Coast thing as much as they prefer like certain types of habitat. So like you're not going to really find them in the desert. You're not going to find them um in like high altitudes so they tend to like lower shrub kind of lands you tend to find them more in like the south east and like the lower non-desert southwest um but that's not to say that you couldn't have them up in oregon or northern california as well they just may not be as common there cool. um we also have a question about um you know, um, someone said that in Western states, they have Western fence lizard whose blood contains a protein that removes the Lyme bacteria while a tick is finished eating and asked if there's any similar lizards in the central and Eastern habitats. And someone also, I'm just gonna make this two part. Okay. But someone also asked about, um, are skinks beneficial to reduce t t skink, uh, ticks as well? So, so 
Is I've it, actually never heard of the Western Fence Lizard and that I will definitely look that up because um, I think that would be a neat study. I haven't heard of anything necessary being in another animal's blood that combats this bacteria. I know a lot of those kind of small to medium um, amphibians and mammals and stuff. So things like skinks and other lizards and opossums and stuff like that that can feed on ticks are always really beneficial because they're decreasing that tick population. Cool. Um, and then someone asked, did you suggest preserving a tick so that it can be tested for pathogens? Yeah, I may have, I was trying to go through it quick, so I may have kind of dropped that sentence, but yeah, so your idea between why you'd want to save that tick is not so much as a keepsake, um, as much as in the event that you do think there's a pathogen, it's much more easier, or it's easier for a doctor to kind of go in and look at that tick and test that tick for a pathogen than all of you. The other thing you can also do is I know University of Rhode Island does it and several states have their department of ag or natural resources sometimes have someone who can test them as well for a fee. Um, and sometimes they can't test them for everything but they can check for some of the more common things in that state. So I would recommend, you can check with your extension service and they would be able to tell you or your state department of natural resource or agriculture. Cool. And there's a, um, a question for Jason. Um, is asked if that was a steel file that you're using to sharpen the chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if she meant S-T-I-H-L or actual steel. Oh, good point. She spelled it S-T-E-L, but, you know, I'll, we'll just go from there. <laughs> well, and, you know, that's a good point. So, yes, it is a steel file both in both cases, um, but I, that's a great question. And I will tell you that all files aren't created equally. I have purchased files at actual chainsaw shops that were very low quality. And I went to Lowe's and got an Oregon file, not that I'm promoting Lowe's here, and they were much better. So you'll, you'll know the difference, um, but uh, you, free handing it is what I did in the video because I'm used to doing it. Um, that's something you need to get used to. Uh, I would suggest taking your chain to the shop and let someone sharpen it for you. But um, we've been doing a lot of sharpening lately. So you need a chart so when you get called out, you're ready, to, you're ready to go and have a backup as well. But good question. That's, that's a, um, that was going to be my question, because as someone who's tried hand sharpening a, a chain even for weeks, um, I'm pretty terrible at it. So, so I think um, I would probably go with taking it to the shop. And then along those lines, um, about how many chains do you keep handy? Because, um, you know, they take, it might take a little bit to sharpen them at the shop. So how many uh, and now you, you saw a bit, but it's always good to know. Well, that's a good question, too. So I try to have a backup, just one. Two's, two's always better. Uh, unless you do a lot of cutting, you, you probably should be able to do the cutting that you can physically do and handle with just one chain. Um, but I, it depends on, you know, if you're running in the ground, you definitely need to change it quick, right? You hit a rock, you hit a piece of fence, you hit a piece of metal, you're done. So having at least one. And I see the questions popping up about the possums too as I throw that in there. Yes, they're big tick eaters. And Emily, I was itching the whole time you were talking. <laughs> the only good thing about chainsaw was it was in the wintertime. I was like, hey, at least we're avoiding the chiggers, but apparently not the ticks as well, right? Yeah. Great. You, you get to avoid the wasps though. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Um, yeah, any other um, questions from the audience? I think we're just about to wrap up. I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, I think everyone's going to go take a shower now and make sure that <laughs> everything is clean um, and their chainsaw is sharp and that they have a, um, especially with all these storms, everyone knows that there's a, there's a run on um, chains right now. So I'm just going to um, thank our presenters again. Um, it was a great, interesting presentation. We will um, attach all the links to um, slides and things and um, resources um, at the forestry webinar link that you joined this presentation from. So um, it will also have the recording from this presentation available in a few days. And all of that you can access from this uh, SREF period info Woodland Stewards link. So um, once again, please um, make sure you take the evaluation after you um, drop this and we hope you'll join us next week for getting started managing your land. Um, and that's it. Bob, if I missed anything, go ahead and interject. But Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. 
As Leslie indicated, if you click on in the chat, go ahead and click on the link to the survey that will launch that. Or if you quit, uh, jump out of the, today's meeting and you still have the portal page open, you'll be able to also participate from there in the evaluation. Uh, and, and the links uh, to the TIC Encounters website, the CDC website, the safety checklist, and the tech. TIC ID charts are already on the portal page, so you can get them there, and you do not have to wait until next week to get them. Okay. So, Excellent. Okay, well, thanks, everybody, and um, I hope everyone stays safe with all these winter storms sweeping the nation. I'm over in Georgia, and we did not get any snow by my house, so I'm a little jealous of the snow, but not of the loss of power. <laughs> so thanks again, everybody. Have a good one.